few weeks ago, uh, probably uh, uh, longer than you can remember, so I'm just going to briefly remind us uh, that we talked about how important it is when we're talking about families, since we're planning our homecoming. It's our spiritual family emphasis, our 70th anniversary as a congregation meeting in this building, and that's significant. We see a congregation is made up of members and families, and so we want to spend some time preparing between now and homecoming of reminding us of how important it is for us to be who we ought to be individually, that as individuals that we are who God would have us to be. And see, no matter what relationship we're talking about, we have to make sure that the individuals are who they need to be. Doesn't matter whether you're talking about the church or you're talking about a, a business or a corporation or a community, it's made up of individuals. So we have to get that part right. And we live in a very confused, upside down world when it comes to those kind of matters. And so it behooves us to go back and say, what did our designer say? What did he provide for us that you and I can remember and make sure that we follow? There's so many definitions to families today, we have to go back and say, is that what God designed? Is that what God will accept? And what can we do to make sure that we demonstrate to those around about us God's design? And again, it all starts with the individual, and there's material that's necessary for us to form any relationship. And that first material that God provided was those individuals. He wanted to make sure that we understand that that strength of a relationship is determined by those who make up the relationship. And he didn't take any chances. He made sure that he provided that example for us in that first couple. When he made Adam, he made him completely whole. He gave Adam the knowledge that Adam needed to have to function in the way God would have him to function. And to take on the responsibility of caring for God's creation. That was important, that that individual be who he needs you to be. And you take those ingredients of those individuals, and you blend them together to make a family. And so God saw it was not good for Adam to be alone. The only solitary member of the human family. And so he made him a helpmate. He made Eve. And he blended them together in that family and provided for us that template that we can follow to make sure that we are who God wants us to be in our families. Don't get that part right. If you don't have the right individuals, then you're not going to have the right relationship. It's just not possible to have. And the good thing for us, anywhere along the way, we realize we're not the material we ought to be, then we can change that. We spent a little time, you remember, talking about what that means to be an individual. That we use the term single to be mean unmarried. And so we thought, God said, it's not good for a person to be unmarried. Well, Adam just happened to be the first one of God's creation. And when he named all the other creatures, he saw that they were paired up so they could produce after their kind. Well, he couldn't produce after his kind because he was the only human there. So it wasn't good for him to be alone. And we distinguish, remember, the difference between being single and alone. Single means whole and unique. And so all of us want to be single. Now, we can choose whether we're married or unmarried, but we all need to be single. We need to be that whole, unique individual that God can use the way God wants to use in His service. But it's certainly not good for us to be alone, exclusive, solitary, by ourselves. Not good for us. And God saw it wasn't good for Adam to be that person. But when all said and done, you take those individuals and you have to make sure that they are built upon the right foundation. Without that foundational support, it doesn't make any difference how strong the material is. And you remember we talked about the Lord's declaration in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23. When he said, He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto a wise man that builds his house upon a rock. And the rains descend, the floods come, and the winds blow and beat on the house, and it fell not, for it is founded upon the rock. So every individual has to decide where they're going to build their lives, whether it's going to be on that solid foundation of the truths that Jesus provided and do what he's asked us to do, or will it be upon that sand? And he emphasizes that the material will be tested. 
He said, he that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not, I would like unto a foolish man that builds his house upon the sand. The rains descend, the floods come, the wind blow, and beat upon that house, and it falls, and great is the fall thereof. So the material is determined by whether we do what God tells us to do or not. And the foundation is whether we build our lives on those instructions or not. So that becomes important. We can't lose sight of that. We have a choice of foundations. But if we're not the individual we ought to be, we likely won't make the right choices of foundations. So we have to work at that. And anywhere along the way, we can change who we are. We can change from being that individual who is not doing what God tells them to do and not following those instructions of the Lord to being that individual who's obedient to those matters. So it's not a hopeless state for us. We can change that anywhere along the way. Sometimes we look around us and we see people that we feel like are, are, have it all together. And they have the life we want them to have, or we'd like to have. But sometimes we don't know the journey that those people have made. We don't know the changes that they had to make. We don't know what they've had to start over and do again. But the key is, the evidence of them having it all together now is they put forth the effort. They made the changes, and they did what God wanted them to be. Once we have those individuals who are who they need to be, then we have to make sure that we understand the maturation process. You see, there is a, a process of human growth and development. We plan according to that. What you and I are aware of is when a you take a child to the doctor, he'll say, well, at this age, he should be this weight and this height. And he should be able to do this or this or this. And sometimes we, we get a little nervous when they say, well, they're kind of behind the curve, you know, and they, uh, they're not really where they ought to be weight-wise. And maybe we ought to run some tests to see if there's something wrong. And see, there's a process that's an expectation that we're going to grow and be who we need to be. The same is true spiritually. As individuals, we can be as God would have us to be. And when we say, I do, with another person, remember after Adam and Eve was placed in the garden, that first wedding ceremony was conducted. Here's what's recorded in chapter 2 and verse 24. Thus, after this pattern you see, thus shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So there is a leaving from mother and father, and there is a cleaving to each other, and they become one flesh, and that means they're giving life or birth to a relationship. Now once it's here, just like that child here, there should be an expectation of development. Once it's here, it's going to have to be cared for, and, and the care that provided is, and the laws that govern it are just like taking care of a child. When that child is born into our family, it is absolutely dependent upon our care. It will not survive without the nurturing and care of those who brought it into this world. And you and I see from time to time where some child is abandoned, just discarded, and it breaks our heart. We just can't believe that someone would, would do that. And yet when you place that in the context of a relationship, in this development of a home, there are a lot of relationships that are just discarded. Two people say, I do, and they give life to a relationship and somehow think it's just going to survive or the other person is going to take care of it. And that may be what happens. You may have one person who does all the effort, just like one parent may care for the child. But it's never going to be fully healthy and strong and never go through that proper development if it's not both people keeping the focus upon that relationship. That becomes important for all of us. So what does it take? You see, when, when we have children, they take on our genetics, don't they? They may have our eye coloring or the, our hair coloring or they may physically look like us, and, but there are some things that we may not even see that we inherit in this giving birth to our children. The same is true with our relationships. It's going to reflect both of the people who gave life to it. And so what 
are the genetic things that we need to make sure that are true within the family? What kind of things should we individually make sure that we bring into this relationship? And, and there needs to be that commitment. That is a spiritual genetic quality that needs to be part of this relationship that we give birth to. We need to make sure that we understand what, what Paul was talking about when he's emphasizing to those folks. And he writes to Timothy and he said, here's what you need to be conscious of, Timothy. You be an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in spirit, in faith, and in charity. You make sure that you are who you need to be. You make that commitment, Timothy, that when people are looking for folks of faith, they know who you are. Well, both individuals within a married relationship need to have that kind of commitment. That they are examples of a believer. That there are those who are willing to commit to that. And in order to do that, what we have to be aware of is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's a commitment, isn't it? If you seek first, that means you made a commitment to say, I know what's going to be first in my life. But then there needs to be this attitude and disposition that we take on that we're honest. And I tell young people when they're, they're courting and they come to me for counseling or they just ask general advice and I mention to them, pay attention to each other. Now I'm not expecting folks to become private investigators and, and stalk their uh, potential mate. But I'm saying you better pay real close attention when you go places and you meet people and you see how they interact with their parents, are they honest? You see, if a young person says to their parent they're going to a particular place and they don't go there, they likely are going to tell you somewhere in your marriage they're going to a particular place and they're not going there. Or if they call into their boss and say, I'm sick, and the two of you have plans to go somewhere and enjoy the day and they're not really sick, now, that may flatter you at first and say, well, you know, they just want to spend time with me, but they weren't honest with their family members. They weren't honest with their employer. You better pay attention to that. You see, the Lord expects us to be honest. In fact, he says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9 that we are to lie not one to another. That's very specific, isn't it? And we know from Proverbs 6, of those seven things that are listed that God hates, that are an abomination to Him, listed among those things is a lying tongue. So it doesn't matter who you're lying to, if you lie, you're capable of lying. And so we want to discard that and make sure that we're honest, that we speak those things that are truthful and right with each other, and that's what it takes for individuals to provide a relationship that's healthy and develops like it ought to. And that if God's looking at it, he'll say, those are the ones that are going to have the relationship I want them to have. And they're developing exactly the way they should. Then there's that responsibility that we're to take on. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, If a man provide not for his own, he denied the faith, it is worse than an infidel. Going all the way back to that first couple, and it said, Thus shall a man leave his father and mother, and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. A lot of things are assumed there. He's capable of leaving, not only emotionally leaving and starting his own family, but financially able to take care of them, physically able to take care of them, and that will be his responsibility. And if he denies that responsibility, then he denied the faith. Now, if that commitment was that we're an example of the believer, that is a spiritual genetic quality that we bring into this relationship, then it'll be evident in how we keep our responsibilities. And there again, we need to pay attention. If we don't diligently carry out our responsibilities in our employment, then it's likely we're not going to carry out our responsibilities in our marriage. A lot of things we could pay attention to along the way. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't marry a person that has, uh, that has flaws. We're saying we need to help them address their flaws before we marry them. Those are important things. All of us have flaws. But we need to make sure that we are honest about how we handle those flaws and we take on the responsibility to correct them. 
You see, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, it says of love that love never faileth. Now, we kind of get caught up in that chapter because it's a chapter on love, and we kind of get lost in that uh, thinking love is just some kind of emotional experience, but it's giving a very graphic agape description of love. In other words, love does what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. Love never faileth. It takes on the responsibility to, to do what is necessary to be done. Now, that's a different kind of love than heart fluttering, isn't it? For us to get excited when we're around someone, there might be times when we're not so excited around that person that we're married to. But love never faileth. We take on the responsibility to do what God would have us to do. And then there is that independence that we've already described from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, that we are able to leave our mother and father and we are to cleave to each other, and that we take on that independence of caring for our own. We're going to do that. It's our family. It's our wife. It's our husband. It's our children. And we don't expect other people to take on that responsibility. We're independent enough in our lives to be able to do that. And we shouldn't marry until we get to that point that we can be independent of our families. Many of the counseling issues that I deal with with young couples is Either they weren't prepared to do that, and that is they weren't prepared to take on that responsibility and be independent, or their parents weren't prepared for that. Sometimes it's not always just the couples. They want to be independent. They want to make sure they take care of themselves, but the parents are always trying to do it for them. And they don't want them to have to go through any growing pains, and they want them to have things, and when those things happen, you no longer can be independent. doesn't mean we can't give each other gifts. It just means we can't interrupt that growth process. We've got to let the spiritual genes to be seen in this particular couple because they've given life to this relationship. And then we see that it's important for us to maintain sensitivity, that we're aware of other people's feelings. Probably if you chose one passage in a very brief way that would indicate that we are to maintain that. When you look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, it says, Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. If we master that part, they say no matter what's happening in our relationship, where there's things that we're shedding tears over, we're, we're crying over, we can do that with each other. We're sensitive enough to know this is a time of sadness that we need to weep. We're heartbroken over it. And we allow each other that grief process, and we share that with each other. But it also says rejoice with those that rejoice. Sometimes in relationships, that's hard to do. That is, maybe your day didn't go so well, or maybe you didn't get that promotion, but your spouse does. Maybe sometimes it's hard to rejoice in that. And yet the context is talking to the church as a whole, but certainly applies to us when we look at our marriages. That we ought to be able to share these things together. That's part of our genetic makeup. We've given life to a relationship that will be sensitive to each other's needs. We know how to cry together. We know how to rejoice together. And that's helpful and instructive. But we also to be temperate. And again, I underscore to young couples who've not yet married and they are contemplating that, and they're infatuated with each other, and I mention to them when they're paying attention, is this person someone who practices self-control? Can they withhold themselves from things or withhold things from themselves? Or they just have to have something when they want it? You have to pay attention to that and say, do they have temperance? This ability to control their anger, Sometimes people make excuses for that. We say, well, you know, I just I got a pretty explosive personality. Well, that's a genetic, isn't it? Spiritually speaking, should Christians have an explosive personality? It doesn't seem to indicate that. When you look at passages like James chapter 1 and verse 19, it said that we are to be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. 
That doesn't sound like an explosive personality, does it? Slow. That means you contemplate things. It doesn't mean you can't get to the point where you're angry at things. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23, uh, 26 and 27 rather, it said, be angry and sin not. And let not the sun go down on your wrath. Now there is an ability to be angry. Angry at something. Maybe angry at a behavior, but not allow that to be sin. Where we cross over that threshold and our wrath then dictates how we treat each other. That's a genetic quality, spiritually speaking, that we need to have. When Peter was writing to the Christians who were being persecuted in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, he said, Add unto your faith virtue, and unto your virtue knowledge, now listen, and unto your knowledge temperance, self-control. You make sure that you put effort to be able to control yourself. And Paul described of himself in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. He said, I buffet my body to bring it in subjection. Lest after I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. So Paul knew that he had to have self-control. And he worked at it. He buffeted his body. He withheld his body from things that his body might have wanted. And we have to have that kind of temperance or self-control and then we ought to strive to be impressionable that context of saying be swift to hear and slow to speak what does that sound like to you what kind of environment would that create if a person is willing to hear that means he'll have to contemplate what he said And if he contemplates what the other person says, that means he's willing to be impressed by that. Not impressed from the standpoint of, of giving in to that person necessarily, but understanding where that person's coming from. Why they have those convictions. Why that's important. That we are to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Then a beautiful passage is found in broader context is, is 1 Peter chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verses 1 through 7. But verse 7 in particular emphasizes that we are to dwell with our spouse. There it says husband. Husband, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. What does that sound like to you? Well, it ought to sound like that you want to know how she feels about things. You want to know how he feels about things. How he's impressed with or not impressed with certain things. Now, if we're not willing to listen... Or if we're not willing to talk, and sometimes that is the case, where you're just not willing to share how you feel about things. And sometimes we think sharing how we feel about things is just going off about our frustrations of the day or the week or the month, our life in general. This is talking about a relationship that we want to know what makes a person happy. We want to know what might be offensive to a person. We want to learn as we go. Denise and I met an old friend this morning while we were at worship, and he's quite up in years now, and he was talking about um, his wife recently passed away, and he said we were married 64 years. He was describing some of his past and how patient his wife was with him and how that had completely, totally changed his life. He said everything that I am and every blessing I've received is because of her influence. Now here's a, an example of what we're talking about. He was impressionable. He said, you know, I was, I was pretty headstrong when we first married. And for the first eight years, uh, she was a faithful Christian, and I just didn't want to hear it. But said she was a faithful Christian. And I said, the good thing about that, and I've known him for a lot of years, and I said, the good thing about that, then became stubborn for the Lord. You took that attitude and disposition of saying, when I feel a certain way, I'm going to hang on to that, and I'm going to be tenacious about it, and you did that as a Christian. But he described what we're just talking about here. He was impressionable. He watched her life. He saw how convicted she was, how consistent she was, and he changed. And when we're willing to change because of what we've learned, we can dwell with each other according to knowledge. 
And then you need to make sure that we have that genetic quality of being active individuals, engaged in our lives. When people become sluggards, and we don't have time to look at all the verses, but if you want to look at, at Proverbs 19, it has a lot to say about those who are lazy or sluggards and how they become conceited in their own thinking. And if they think they're wiser than, than seven people who have their life together. And so it tells us that they find excuses not to be active. And one of the Proverbs says, they're always saying, well, there's a lion in the street, and I might be slain if I go out there. In other words, I'm just not going to put forth any effort. I'm not going out and face any danger. I'm not going to become a lion slayer. I am going to avoid activity. They're called a sluggard. So we can't have that disposition in our own individual spiritual lives, and we certainly can't have that in our marriages. We have to make sure that we everything that God wants us to be. Probably summing that up, Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. He said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, be ready for it, always abounding in the work of the Lord, inasmuch as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you go back to that first couple, he played that beautiful garden that all of us would like to be part of, and he said, now tend it and keep it. He wanted them to be active. It's a blessing. It's beautiful. It has everything you need. You stay engaged in tending it and keeping it. So it should be in our marriages in our homes, make sure we're engaged in keeping it alive and protecting it. And then finally, we have to be nurtured. Have to make sure that this is an ongoing process. You've heard me say hundreds of times in the last four years, whatever we nurture is going to grow. And we can nurture negative things and those negativities are going to grow. Or we can nurture positive things and those positive things will grow. But if anything grows, it has to be nurtured. If you watch children and they're not nurtured, they're not physically fed, they're not emotionally fed, they're not going to grow physically or emotionally. Sometimes children are fed physically, but emotionally they're not encouraged. They're not fed. Sometimes in relationships, we don't make sure that they are nurtured. They're taken care of. There's a passage found in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18 through 21. And in summation, here's what it says. It encompasses that our family relationship is totally dependent upon nurturing. It starts out by saying, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Wives. Submit yourself to your own husband, for this is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter toward them. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they become discouraged. Did you notice how nurturing each of those instructions were? Something that you needed to do to make sure that the ones that you were responsible for are cared for properly. Children have that same responsibility in the home to be obedient to their parents in all things. That nurtures that obedient relationship in the home. And the husband and wife have responsibilities of, of nurturing. And with that being the case, we understand the Lord's will is accomplished. As you think about what we've just talked about tonight, a very simple acrostic, if we have those spiritual genetics in place, you see the first letter in each of those words will spell out for us Christian, which takes us back where we started. Paul said to Timothy, be an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Those individuals that God has created, us as individuals, need to be examples of those who are trying to do what God would have us to do. And those who claim to be 
Christ-like people, Christian folks, need to have these spiritual genetics in place. And if we don't have, we can change that tonight. There's just something that's therapeutic about knowing that. You see, if you're outside of Christ, then you can enter Christ tonight. If you believe that Jesus is God's Son, you're willing to turn away from your sins and repentance. If you will, with your own lips, confess His name, if you will submit your life to Him in baptism, you can enter this spiritual nurturing relationship and be called a child of God. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 to 28. Those of us who've done that have a responsibility now to embody those things. And you may say, well, some of you may not be married. Some of you may be widowed. Some of you may be anticipating getting married. And we may be in all different stages of where we are in these relationships. But in the body of Christ, we can help each other be the individuals we need to be. So whatever relationship we form, these genetic qualities will be first and foremost. And if they haven't been, here's what you and I know. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can help you do that tonight, and we can do that now while we stand and while we sing. <clears throat> we'll be first and foremost. And if they haven't been, here's what you and I know. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful Again, nothing time. but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Brother Jerry and Brother Josh. Y'all both did a great day, uh, job today on those lessons. Our closing song is 775.